Well, hi there. I am going to begin my discussion of this book right here, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses by Richard Balcom. So let's get into it. Um, one of the things that I look for first when I am beginning reading these uh, books of Christian apologetics is a, uh, an idea of who they are writing the book for. Um, Richard Balcom doesn't really say, at least in the first chapter, there, there's no introduction to this book. He just, you know, jumps right into it. Uh, so it's hard for me to tell who the intended audience is. Um, I, in all fairness, I don't know Richard Balcom's religious beliefs. I, I, I'm, it's obvious he is a Christian of some variety, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, so I hope I'm not making a, an invalid assumption. But with that said, I would like to know, uh, is Richard Balcom, for instance, writing to Christians who believe in, you know, similar to himself? Uh, for lack of a better term, I'll call that evangelical Christianity. Is he writing to other Christians, but maybe of a different uh, denomination uh, to argue fine points of Christianity to fellow believers? Or is Richard Balcom writing to skeptics of Christianity, maybe secular historians, uh, people like uh, Bart Ehrman, people like uh, myself, maybe? Uh, I don't know. And one of the reasons why I think this is important is because in this genre of writing, especially, <laughs> uh, depending on who your audience is, your language changes uh, because people come into these kinds of books with different beliefs, different assumptions, different backgrounds, and we all are speaking different languages. Um, uh, it appears to me that Richard Balcom, at least in the first chapter, it appears to me that he expects his readership to already take for granted that the Gospels are history. It's just a matter of convincing that already believing audience that that history is based not on oral tradition that was passed down by word of mouth for decades upon decades upon decades of anonymous um, transmission, but was based on eyewitness testimony. So either way, he's writing to a Christian base. I, it, it, there's just a few subtle hints dropped in here and there in this book. Uh, I, I, I should say in this first chapter that makes me think that he doesn't come out and explicitly say it. Okay. If that is correct, then, well, we've got a, already <laughs> a bit of a problem. You see, Kostenberger and Kruger and others uh, who are so disappointed at Bart Ehrman for not engaging with the arguments of Richard Balcom, um, to me, appear to think that Bart Ehrman should engage with the arguments presented by Richard Balcom. But see, if they're already not speaking the same language, see, Bart Ehrman already doesn't take as an assumption that the Gospels are already uh, true history and it's just a matter of finding out who the authors are. If he already doesn't accept that, then without that starting assumption made, you know, without those, those, those premises being agreed upon up front, then why, you know... Why should uh, Kostenberger and Kruger think that Ehrman's going to take any of Balcom's arguments seriously? Um, you know, apparently they think Balcom will convince Ehrman. So, you know, it's important that we're all speaking the same language, that we're all coming to these books with the same basis, that we're, you know, we, we understand how we stand. So it's a little... You know, it's not a it, it's not a huge thing, but it's a little disappointing to me that Richard Balcom doesn't state up front who he's intending to write this book for. Is he writing it for the critic? I I kind of doubt it. At, at at least after reading the first chapter, um, I guess I can get into why later. But 
let me explain a little bit where I'm coming from, uh, what assumptions I'm bringing into a book like this. Um, I'll just be explicit and state up front, no, I do not think that the Gospels are um, history. Uh, what history is in it is kind of buried beneath uh, the surface. I mean, you, you let's put it this way. Reading the Gospels, you find there's more to learn about the history of the authors and where this book came from than any history that's to be gained by reading the text as as factually correct. I think the history that's in the Gospels is actually buried in, you know, who the authors are. Uh, speaking of which, I don't think uh, there's any way to know who the authors of the Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John, I don't think there's any way to know who they are. I mean, somebody had to write those things. Uh, who are they? Blast if I know. Um, but it appears to me at least that the four Gospels, at least the first three, are in some way dependent on each other. That is, that they are not independent writings, but in some interlocking way, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke depended on each other. Now, in what way they depended on each other, I have my own ideas, and there's a lot of debates over that. Not important right now. The point is, they are not independent sources of eyewitness testimony. Rather, it appears that they copied and edited from each other. So they're not relying on eyewitnesses. They're looking at, at, at literary texts. They're looking at Gospels and rewriting their own Gospels based on those. At least that's the way it appears to me, and that's how I am approaching this, uh, this, uh, this book. Um... What else should I say? Okay, so when I was a Christian, a um, long time ago, <laughs> um, yeah, I took it for granted that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I took it for granted that, of course, they were history and that everything that they uh, said about the life and events of Jesus was historically and factually correct. No problem. Did I think it was based on eyewitness testimony? Well, you bet I did, because Pastor Skip of Calvary Chapel <laughs> told me they were based on eyewitness testimony. So, you know, in my mind, I would think, well, Matthew wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew was a uh, disciple of Jesus, so of course he was present at the events that were spoken of uh, in his gospel. Now, what about things like where he, where the, where the disciple or the apostle Matthew was not present? What about, let's say, the birth of Jesus or the nativity? Um, you know, Matthew wasn't there. How did he know about that? Well, you know, in, in my mind, I imagined, well, you know, he, he got a chance to talk to the mother of Jesus, Mary, he uh, got a chance maybe to talk to other people uh, who were present at those events um, and uh, write them down. I mean, heck, he even um, talked to Jesus himself. I mean, Jesus, you know, certainly had a say in a lot of this. Why couldn't he talk to him about his, you know, the, the, his, his childhood and his birth and where he came from? and then write it down. I mean, if anybody would know, Jesus would know, right? So so Matthew wrote all this stuff down based on that type of eyewitness testimony. I didn't put a heck of a lot of thought into it. I mean, that certainly made sense to me. He's writing about a man named Jesus. Where does he get his information from? He gets it from Jesus, you know? I mean, what's the problem? <laughs> so that's that's that was my thinking back in those days. It was It seemed pretty elementary. But, you know, something else also struck struck me it's that it it seems to me also in a weird way that a lot of fundamentalist christians place such a huge emphasis on this idea of eyewitness testimony that the authors of the gospels were there at the events as they happened and you know we all see their analyses of the dating of the gospels 
and they want to to place the gospels the authorship of the gospels as soon after the death of jesus as they possibly can um 70 a.d not good enough 60 50 heck if they could they make it mere weeks after the death of jesus when the gospels were written they're always stressing that early date the earliest possible date that they can get by golly they'll take it they want it to be as soon after the death of jesus as they can why 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 do they want to do this well because in this society this post-faith society that we live in we want evidence and you know in our society we say that eyewitness testimony um, is most accurate when it is written down or made a, as a testimony as soon after the events as they happened. Okay, so, you know, Jesus dies about, what, 30, 33 A.D. or so? And, what, the Gospel of Mark was written 30 40 years after that's as early as they can get it well they'll take it but the point is that it wasn't written a hundred years after so they say they can't have that because they need to have that eyewitness testimony and it seems to me that why should that be important i mean the gospels are 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 divinely inspired if they're divinely inspired what does it matter when they were written or by who I mean, they were inspired by the Almighty, so what? I mean, that's not a flippant statement either. I mean, look at most of the events in the Old Testament. I mean, some big ticket items too. Uh, what, the Garden of Eden, for instance. I mean, the, the, the whole, according to Christian theology anyway, the whole origin of the original sin and the degradation of humanity and the whole reason for that Jesus had to come to earth in the first place right there in the Garden of Eden. Who wrote that? Who was the testimony there? Who was the eyewitness there? Well, tradition says that Moses wrote it millennia after the events uh, of the Garden of Eden. Um, apparently, eyewitness testimony is just not important for that, but it's a big ticket item in Christianity. Well, my contention is if eyewitness testimony doesn't matter for that, why should it matter for the Gospels? It's It's seems to me an anxiety of not having any evidence. We, again, we're a post-faith society, and we'll take any evidence that we can get. That's my lousy opinion, and that's how I'm approaching it. Hmm. Okay, well, I guess you know uh, how I'm approaching this book, and uh, so much for chapter one. I think I'm out of time. <laughs> so I'll tell you what, I'll... Um, now with that little bit of background, uh, I think I'll wait till the next time to dive right on into chapter one. So uh, do it next time. Take care.